What a day that was. Now, what happened with Sinatra? You didn't finish. I, 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 I'll, I'll find the article. I, I know okay, the Esquire called, article. It, it, there's, about, it, you, there's two places to find it. The first was in Esquire, and it happened in... Uh, Sixty-five, sixty-six. Had I written the Oscar? Uh, well, I'd just written a movie. Uh, the less uh, said about which is. Uh, yeah, but I saw the I saw your Elkie Summer. Uh... Susan wanted it. I bought it. Leave me alone. Don't even remind me, please. <laughs> you know, doctors are lucky. They get to bury their mistakes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, we had this uh, this really ugly scene in which I wound up laying out his bodyguard with a pool cue. His bodyguard, you've seen The Magnificent Seven. Yeah. Okay, you know Brad Dexter? Yeah. Brad, did you ever see The Magnificent Seven? You know the one who the, keeps keep saying... Uh, the one with the jaw? The, the, there's gold in it, there's gold in it. That's yeah, it, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. What? Chris, it's gold, it's gold. <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh, that's sweet. Uh, my, the best line out of that, of course, is where, <laughs> is where McQueen, who was also a pal, you know my Steve McQueen saved my life? I got a picture of him and me upstairs that was taken just before he saved my life, about two hours before he saved my life. And I'm not, that's not hyperbole, which we play in the epitome. <laughs> um, uh, 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 McQueen, McQueen comes back. He had gone looking for a job. And, he, and, he, and, he, and Chris and the two uh, uh, peons are sitting there at the table. And he says, come on, sit down, have a drink. And they said, any luck? He says, yeah. The guy over at the Mercantile says I'd make a Cracker Jack salesman. Cracker Jack. <laughs> and just the way, I just adore that, that line. That's a great way. I like it better than Seven Samurai. Yeah, I really yeah. do. Everybody compares it. But it's, it's so quality. No, it has, it, it has its real, yeah. yeah and Jimmy yeah. Coburn is. Yeah. Just, Br Jimmy Coburn, Br uh, Steve McQueen, and I uh, all three took from Bruce Lee at about the same time. Huh. We were all students of Bruce's at about the same time. So... Anyhow, uh, uh, Sinatra shows up with a coterie, and the room was filled. It was a Friday or a Saturday night, and everybody was anybody was in, was in town. I think they go to the Daisy because it was the Inn Club. I had gotten into it. I was destitute, but I had finessed my way into a membership, which is another story that involves Aaron Spelling, but we won't go into that story because it takes it too far back. And he comes in, now this is in the height of the Carnaby Street dressing. And I'm wearing, and I still got them, a pair of soft deer, uh, 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 deer stalker boots that, like Robin Hood, they come up and they fold over. Really handsome, soft brown leather. Uh, and a pair of uh, Loden green uh, corduroy pants tucked into them. And a, um, uh, not cashmere, a, uh, uh, a suede uh, a, a suede top with with thongs, uh, so I was I was kind of a Captain Blood kind of looking guy. But I'm five foot five. I weighed about 120 pounds. This basketball I'm schlepping here was not in evidence at the time, and um, I was single and doing very well with the ladies. I gotta tell you. In fact, to be perfectly candid, I was a bit of a slut. Uh, they said I had fucked every woman on the Western Sea Coast and was working his way inland. And in walks Sinatra, who is dressed like a Kansas City hitman. <laughs> the black, the black right. suit, the narrow wingtip shoes, the little, the little black uh, uh, hanging judge tie, and, and the white on white uh, mafioso uh, shirt. And uh, in with him comes a bunch of other people, all of whom are in his thrall. And Mamie Van Doren again with the... <laughs> Anyhow, it's like... It was like a nighttime shot of Ausable Chasm. <laughs> not, not good. So uh, I'm shooting pool with, uh, with Leo DeRocher and Omar. Omar was a terrible pool player. Terrific bridge player and a wonderful, wonderful guy. One of the sweetest guys who ever lived, but what a fish. Yeah. What a fish. We used to take him. Peter and I, Peter, Peter would make Omar crazy by taking his eye out and putting it down on the table and saying, Eyeball in the hip pocket. He, he would, and and Omar would say, "Stop, stop, stop!" And then, and then DeRocher, DeRocher and I. Wait, I got to show you. DeRocher and I, when we were kids, <laughs> we, learned how, we learned how to do that. You know, which would drive away bullies in this in the school. Yeah, DeRocher and I would do that. Omar would go up a wall. Anyhow, it was, we were a great foursome, and people would sit around and watch and listen to us chucking and jiving and just cutting up touches, and. Um, 
in comes uh, old Blue Eyes, and I had always adored him. I mean, I loved his music, for Christ. I grew up on Sinatra. How can you not love it? And he sits down, and for some inexplicable reason, had, having nothing to do, I didn't say a word to him, I didn't know him, never met him, he starts, he starts cranking on me. And, uh, and he is fronting me pretty, pretty severely. And he starts off, I mean, I'm not going to go into the whole thing, because it's all in the article, yeah. uh, which is written by Gay Talese, of course, who was one of the great gonzo journalists of our time. And uh, he says, uh, are those Spanish boots? I didn't know who the hell he was talking about. I'm busy working the table. And somebody nudges me and said, Mr. Sinatra is talking to you. I look over and I said, yeah. He said, are those Spanish boots? I said, no. And I go back to another shot. About two minutes go by. And you got to understand, I ran over from home when I was 13. I was riding boxcars. I was driving a dynamite truck in North Carolina when I was 14. I know when somebody is fronting me. I know when somebody is trying to jack me up. And I know right from the get-go. When he did the Spanish boots, I hadn't yet gone. But about a minute and a half later, he says, are those Italian boots? Now I know he's fucking with me. Right. And I say, no. In that tone, no. And uh, I go walking around the table, and everybody in the room is silent because there is an ominousness when you when you see something like this taking shape, and they nobody wanted to get in his way, nobody. Right. And uh, said, uh, uh, "Are those English boots?" <laughs> and they were. And I said, "Why are you talking to me? Do we know each other?" And he says. I don't like the way you're dressed. I said, people in hell want ice water. It don't mean shit to me. Now, everybody in the room is saying, Ellison is going to die. Ellison is going to turn up as part of the 503 freeway. <laughs> you know who Robert Silverberg is, Bob Silverberg? No. The writer? Silverberg is pretty well known. Pretty well known, right? Anyhow, Bob... Bob Silverberg once saw me at a convention in Philadelphia stand off 11 guys from a gang in New Jersey, 1952, 53, and uh, drove him out of the hotel uh, by myself. And uh, Silverberg wrote, he said, Ellison is fearless, which is to say, He's not smart, he's stupid, but he's fearless. He doesn't seem to have any fear. And that's true. I, I'm, there's nothing I'm afraid of. I mean, I, if a snake was here, I would, I'm very cool. My wife freezes. Um, <laughs> my big mouth and I are, are, are always getting me in trouble. And I'm, without the fear gag reflex, you wind up doing shit you would never in your right mind do. So here I am talking back to fucking Frank Sinatra and uh, who who I know has hired guys to beat the crap out of other guys or he can get me killed at the studio and and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on with him making remarks and then he asks he says uh, he says what do you do well I said uh, I'm a plumber do you remember the song uh, all I want for Christmas from our two front teeth or I saw mommy kissing yeah. Jimmy Boyd Jimmy Boyd, who was a talk about names out of the past, Jimmy Boyd was this red-haired, freckle-faced dick uh, who grew up to be a dink. And uh, because that's, you, go, you know, you go through three stages of your life. You're a, 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 a young dink, uh, an older, a young dink, an older dick, and a creep. Anyhow, <laughs> he was, uh, uh, he and I had had a run-in some weeks before uh, because he had said something smart-ass to me. And uh, he was making his living at that time uh, teaching wealthy women to play tennis and screwing them on the side when their husbands were not around. And he tried to pick a fight with me, and I said, look, I said, you're in much better condition than I am. You're taller than I am. I said, you got, you know, you've been working out and you play tennis every day. I said, I'm, I'm a massive, you know, stringy crap. I said, you're, you're, but I'm tenacious, and I have a very high pain threshold, which is true. And I said, so you're going to have to kill me. 
I said, that's the first thing. But while you're trying to kill me, which is going to take some time, I'm only going to be doing one thing. I'm going to be working on your tennis hand. <laughs> I said, and I've seen you swing here, and you swing, well, you know, the, and I said, I'm going to start with the finger first, the forefinger, and I'm going to break it or bite it off if I can. If I can't bite it off, I'm going to bust it back. I said, then I'm going to go for the second. And I said, by the time you've killed me, I said, I'll be up here on the wrist and you will never, ever play tennis again. And the guy said, he's out of his fucking mind, and he left. <laughs> so, um, uh, Jimmy Boyd says to Sinatra, he's not a plumber. He's a movie writer. He wrote the Oscar. Well, the Oscar had just finished shooting, and Sinatra had a role in it. And uh, so he, had a, he had a guest cameo. So Sinatra says, well, I've seen it. It's a piece of shit. And I said, well, it takes shit to know shit. And I said, um, since the movie hasn't been released, it's kind of amusing to me that you've seen it already. But you're in it. So you're shit in shit. And what do you think of that? Well, <laughs> he starts to get off the chair, but he wouldn't fight me on his own. At that moment, Brad Dexter comes in from the other room because somebody had gone in and told him he was sitting with Dean Martin, apparently, and the rest of the entourage. Frank is bagged, and Frank is behaving badly. Go get Frank. Now, Brad Dexter was a behemoth. He was gigantic. <laughs> he was built well, and you know, you know how he became Sinatra's bodyguard? He saved Sinatra's life. They were doing um, Hell in the Pacific, or whatever the hell that fucking stupid movie was that Sinatra directed uh, about the last guy on some island, and there was a... To shit it's called something like None But the Brave or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, always, we always get confused with Lonely or the Brave, right. which it ain't, which, which is a great is, yeah. movie. Yeah. Now, this was None But... Yeah. And uh, they were on the yacht, and he fell overboard, and Dexter saved him. And he said to him, you've always got a job with me. So he, he became Dexter's side boy. Uh, and Brad Dexter was a very nice man. He was big. It's like the genie in Thief of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. He's nice, but he's big. And, and uh, 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 Dexter comes in and says, uh, Frank, and Sinatra says to him, and of course it's dead quiet in the room, even, even DeRocher, Falk, and Sharif had backed against the wall. Nobody wanted to be anywhere near me for fear of getting hit by a gobbet of flying flesh, I presume. Right. And uh, he says, why are you interrupting me? Can't you see I'm talking to this guy? Which is the code take over. So now Dexter comes around and he says, uh, come on, why don't you leave? And I said, what do you mean, why don't I leave? I have a membership. I'm a member here. He said, well, Frank doesn't like the way you're dressed. I said, I don't like the way Frank is dressed. <laughs> and, 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 and Sinatra's saying something from, the back, from behind him. And I say, hey, you, shut the fuck up. The contest for the fastest mouth in the West isn't open. You got the title. Well, now <laughs> Dexter does almost like this. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm going to be in Beverly Hills, you know, the slam by morning. I've got a, this tour. And I truly, we looked like the Trilon in Paris. Here. He was this big, and I'm, I'm, I, I came up to maybe his, his belt buckle. And I walk around the table to get away from this, and my shot was cue ball there, of, 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 of focus ball down here, and I'm getting ready to shoot, and Dexter hangs his hand over... No, it was reversed. That was at this end. Uh, Dexter hangs his hand over the pocket. And he says, I suggest you go. And I said, if you don't take your hand out of that pocket, in about three seconds, you're going to drag back about six inches of bloody stub. Now, you say, gee, nobody's that fast. I'm that fast. <laughs> when I get in a fight, and I get in a lot of fights, <laughs> I don't care if they fucking kill me, if the blood is spurting from my face, if the bones are just, if I can get off three good lines, three good lines, that's all I care about, <laughs> then I'm cool. You can do whatever you want with me. So Dexter doesn't move his hand, and I hit that cue ball. I hit that cue ball as hard as I could, and it hit the pocket. Went, <laughs> Dexter got his hand out. So now Dexter comes around the table, and he grabs the pool cue. And I just lift it up like this and go, boom, right in the solar plexus, right here. And he went over the table. Well, now everybody goes bug fuck because now it has escalated to violence. And in comes Jack Hansen, who was the owner. Jack Hansen uh, owned Jack's Slacks, big 
famous thing, loved to fuck young girls and models and shit like that. Had a wonderful wife, but he was busy fucking them all the time. And uh, Jack said, I'm not going to have this here, I'm not going to have this here. And they dragged Sinatra, literally dragged Sinatra by the armpits into the next room. Now Jack says, you got to get out of here. And I said, it's like the scene in Pete Kelly's Blues, where Marty Milner, you know, has the fight with the with the he, he, he creams one of the sluggos, and and Jack Webb's running him out through the back alley. He says, "Get out of here, get out of here!" And he goes down the rainy alley, and they machine gun him, and he falls among the garbage cans. Um, uh, anyhow, uh, uh, he says, "You got to get out of here, you got to get." And I and and he pushes me outside, and I was driving a gunmetal blue Austin Healey at the time with a louvered bonnet because I had raced at Watkins Glen. And I brought it out here to the coast, and I really loved that car. And he said, you know, you don't come back to the club for a week. And I said, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And I went home. <laughs> well, about a week or so later, uh, other things happened. I mean, the threats, the phone calls, all this and all that and all the blah, blah, blah. But then about a week later, I go back to the club. Late in the afternoon, I got out of the studio early. And I went over to, to have a grilled cheese sandwich at the, at the counter they had there. And Jack Hansen comes out, and he says, do you know who... Um, uh, Gay Talese's. Well, this was soon after Gay Talese's book, uh, New York, A Serendipitous Journey, came out. And I said, of course I know who Gay He's magnificent. He said, well, he's sitting inside and he'd like to talk to you. I said, me? What the hell does he want to talk to me about? He said, I don't know. So I go in and there sits Gay Talese. I recognize him immediately. That, that, uh, he, he looked like a younger Thomas, uh, Tom Wolfe, the, the, Tom, the yeah. white suit Tom Wolfe. And just elegant and slim faced, very handsome guy. And we start talking and I'm raving on about his work and how I loved it. And I knew all of his articles by heart because I had Esquire every month. And he says, listen, I hear you had a little fight with uh, Frank Sinatra in here a week or so ago. I said, eh, it's no big deal, it's bullshit. He said, well, tell me about it. And I said, mm, uh, he's come on, come on, tell me. So I told, I told him, what I've just told you, but in more detail, because it was Gay Talese. And I love telling stories, as you can obviously tell. And when I got all done, he wasn't taking any notes at all. And I said, uh, and uh, I said, I've had calls all week from people telling me I'll never work in town again, or that I'm about to get cement over shoes. And uh, I said, other people who hate him, who want to hire me, and I've been telling them all to go fuck themselves on both sides. And he says, uh, he says, yep, yeah. he says, that's what happened. And I said, well, yeah, that's what happened. I said, but how do you know I'm telling you the truth? He says, because I was there. I said, what? He was part of the entourage. He had been following Sinatra around for a month doing that famous piece, which became right. Frank Sinatra Has a Cold. And he was sitting two chairs down from Mamie Van Doren. I didn't recognize him. I didn't see him. He was pretty much behind me all the time. And he says, you know, he says, I've been, I followed Frank for a month. He said, then I went back to every place he had been in that month and talked to everybody blind and had them tell me the story. And he said, everybody aggrandized themselves. Everybody blew it out of proportion. Everybody says, but you, you told me exactly. He says, in fact, those are the same words. And he brought out his notebook and he said, here, you said, and you said, right. and, you, and I said, well, yeah, I got this telephonic memory, not, tele, not eidetic, but it's telephonic. Uh, if I hear something, now, see, I can't read music, but if I hear it once, I could sing it. So uh, we became friends, and he wrote the article, and he left out the last part because he knew if he put it in there, they'd have to do something about me. Up to the point where Frank gets taken away, he was able to finesse it, and it's, in, it's all in the article. So what's, what's left out? The part that's left out is me knocking Dexter under the, right. under oh, okay. the pool table. Yeah. All the rest of it, every, everything else is there. Uh, in more detail than this, I mean, he didn't have Jimmy Boyd's Frank, actual Frank's name. Frank's got a cold. Frank, Frank, Frank Sinatra has a cold. Has a cold. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. in. It's in. There's two places to get it. One of them is in his. Uh, uh, you can you can you can pull up. Last year, Esquire did this anniversary issue, and if you pull up that issue, there was a there was a uh, uh, a booklet that they included of their their number one pieces, number one nonfiction, number one fiction, number one essay, whatever. And that's the that's the piece. Huh. And it's in. The other is in. Uh, and you can probably get it off the internet, is a copy of Gay's book, Fame and Obscurity, in which it appears. Right. And for years, that was the first thing everybody asked me. Then people forgot. You know, when 
for most of the members of this generation, nostalgia is what they had for breakfast. <laughs> so, uh, but oddly enough, it keeps being reprinted, and yeah. it was reprinted in the L.A. either the Free Press or the or the or, the, or one of the L.A. under not. And did she did uh, what's her name uh, Kitty Kelly use it in her book? Yes. Okay, I'm surprised because I, I read that book years ago when it came. I don't out. know how much she used because I never read the book. But Kitty... I just remember the Dominic Dunn Daisy story, yeah. where I'll, I'll, uh, the the Maitre D comes up to Sinatra and says, I'm, "Mr. Dunn, I'm so sorry, Mr. Sinatra has made me do this," and then he takes something and he bangs it over his head, and Sinatra paid him like five hundred dollars to go over there and bang that guy on the head. Yeah, he, he never liked... is that the liked... worst thing ever? And yeah, then Sinatra Dominic Dunn says, Dunn he says, to this day, if I hear a Sinatra recording, I have to leave the room. <laughs> what a creep. <laughs> oh, horrible. Yeah. yeah. Horrible. He, he's, he's, you know, the, the, the evil, good and evil are, are so relative. They're so, so nebulous. They're so amorphous. A definition of, of evil that works is if you've got power, enormous power, and you can either use it well or badly... And you choose to use it badly, that's evil. That's evil, yeah. So he does all these great things. You know, a guy gives, gives a flat tire on the Jersey Turnpike. Mm -hmm. He fixes it. He gives him a whole uh, television uh, mm -hmm. center. That's fine. <laughs> but that kind of largesse is easy. If you're if you're the king, you can throw money out to everybody. Right. But but when when it comes down to showing your true nature and you're spiteful and mean spirited, yeah. Not a nice man. Yeah, I can't listen to Sinatra either anymore. <laughs> it's it's very sad. Yeah. But yeah. I can always listen to Jackie Perez. Yeah. And for an old man with a pain in the chachma, <laughs> right here, let me tell you. Do you have Jackie uh, CDs, or, or can we give, give you some? Uh, yeah, uh, anything you want to give me. The, two, the ones you sent me. Or he, David sent them, yeah. The David sent. Yeah. I haven't even had, I've been so damn busy. What did you, did you send, like? Uh, I, sent a, I sent, sent a bunch of rare, rare Un unreleased stuff. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anything else you can find, and I will, and I will happily pay you for them. No, I mean, no, I know don't you. Bother, yeah. don't need, don't bother me. Well, the ten dollars seem to bother you so <laughs> much. Right? We'll just He's just in them. shock. That's all. <laughs> what? Does somebody actually ask to be paid? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't write in my letter that you know, in my cover letter to everybody that everybody's done this as a labor of love. I gotta say now, except for Harlan except Harlan Ellis, ten dollars. <laughs> Trust me, that was a labor of love, son. <laughs> That's all it was. Uh, I, we will we will let you go. I but the one last thing I wanted to tell you is there's a very strange uh, coincidence. The fight that you described yeah. is extremely similar. I just directed a film with Peter Falk, and he, there's a bar scene where he's playing pool, and he takes his eye out. The way you hit no, the way you hit Brad Dexter is the way he does in the scene. Purely coincidental. Yeah, you it's just, very funny though. Well, I, I learned that on were... the road. I mean, I, I, I'm not a pool hustler, but I shoot a good stick. And and whenever somebody tries, to, they always grab the stick. Yeah, exactly. And that's what he does. Yeah. And then it, you yeah. just yank it up and go, boom! You get him, and it and and it's at exactly the right place to incapacitate. Anything. I have a feeling that Peter did that himself. I don't think that we choreographed it. I think he came up with that too. I can't remember. Tell Peter if you talk to him. Tell him I said hello. Yeah. I haven't seen him in years. I adored that man. Yeah. In fact, that awful movie that I wrote, I wrote originally for Steve McQueen and Peter Falk, and they wound up casting Stephen, Stephen Boyd, Boyd <laughs> and Tony Bennett in his one <laughs> acting role. It was, and, and as I watched it on the night of the premiere, I sank lower and lower and lower. I said, this is the end of my feature film career, and it was. I have never done a feature film since then. Well. I've had